Welcome to the RKD Group Thinkers podcast, the podcast for nonprofit marketers. It's a show about the people who influence nonprofit marketing and fundraising. And uh, and unlike other shows that talk about the craft of fundraising, we focus on the people, the pioneers, the thinkers, the influencers, in this case, the cultural curators, um, diving into inspirations and motivations behind uh, the brightest minds that influence the nonprofit sector. So um, we uh, we love our listeners. We truly love connecting with folks and, and including hearing from you all. If you like this episode, uh, give us a review on whatever platform it is that you're tuning in. We would certainly appreciate that. Ronnie, I don't know how you're going to set this one up, man. You got your hands full. Yeah, I'm just like... I'm literally going to just read through all of his background because it's just impressive to see the list. So our guest today is Dr. Marcus Collins. Uh, he's an award-winning marketer. And as he calls himself, he's a cultural translator. And like we jump into that right out of the gate of what that means. But uh, a little bit on his background, he is the former chief strategy officer at Wyden and Kennedy, which if you're not familiar with them, they're the ones behind Nike's Just Do It ads, uh, former head of digital strategy for Beyonce. Uh, he's currently a marketing professor at the University of Michigan. Um, he's already been inducted into the American Advertising Federation's uh, Hall of Achievement, and he helped launch the Brooklyn Nets uh, when they moved from New Jersey. And now he is the author of a best-selling book called For the Culture, The Power Behind Why, The Power Behind What We Buy, What We Do, and Who We Want to Be. And so that was that was a long list, but it honestly it pales in comparison to just like the knowledge and the passion that you'll hear when we talk to him here. He just he has so much to share. Marcus is truly an influencer of like the most positive sense of society. And uh, I hope that that doesn't oversell. There's no way like, and so here's the thing. Here's what I'll say um, as we get to this episode, just buckle up, buckle up and, and get ready to think about uh, your work in the nonprofit space in a different way, because that's uh that's what you're, you're walking into. So uh, here is Dr. Marcus Collins on the RKD Group Thinkers podcast. All right, Dr. Marcus Collins, what's a, what is a cultural translator? I like to think of it as someone who are able, who's able to identify the cultural characteristics of one party and articulate those conventions and expectations to another party in such a way that they can understand it and also operationalize it, right? They can do something about it. And the idea as a practitioner in marketing is oftentimes companies are trying to talk to groups of people um, and there is a language barrier. They want to say who they are and why there are, there's rele they're relevant for these group of people, but they can't talk in a way that the group of people understand and vice mm -hmm. versa. So my role in many ways as a marketing practitioner has been about taking what is true about this entity and what they want to say and communicating in ways that another entity can understand it. And what I realized is that skill set doesn't just sit in the world of marketing communications, but also happens in the classroom, it happens on stages, it happens in text, uh, and in and, 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 and more and more spaces I'm learning to, to uh, I'm, I'm learning to uh, realize. So in that, I feel like the idea of a cultural translator continues to evolve because the spaces and places in which that skill set is necessary continues to evolve. Where were you a couple decades ago when I was in school and needed needed that? Like, and honestly, here's the thing for our listening audience: uh, Marcus joined Ronnie and I and members of the RKD team at an event that we put on in DC in DC uh, in the fall of 2023, and uh, and at the end of a 15 minute session. Uh, I saw some 85 to 100 uh, nonprofit professionals 
eager to go back to school under the tutelage of of you, Marcus. Like, well, you know, I, I suffered too. You know, I, I as a student, I think that some of the the obligation uh, I feel as uh, an academic, as a an instructor in the classroom, is to provide an environment in which many people can learn. Right. And we all learn differently. Right. We, some of us are requires visual stimulation. Some of us re require space to reflect. Some of us require space to do. Some of us uh, require sort of oratory um, um, uh, 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 communication for us to get it. Some of us require a combination of all those things. And therefore, the classroom should be just as dynamic as the many ways in which we learn. I found myself as an engineering student feeling like I was dumb feeling like I was, that I didn't belong in those classrooms because I didn't get it. And I thought that that deficiency of quote unquote, getting it was a, was a, was a, was a demonstration of my, my intellect. The truth of the matter mm -hmm. is that the classroom just wasn't established for my learning style. So as a instructor today, I do everything I can to try to hit all the many ways by which we learn so that people like me, Marcus, back in the day, who are in my classrooms today, uh, can feel seen and also can, can learn. So you, you mentioned that idea of like, okay, so you start as an engineering student. Rewind to like little Marcus. What, what prompted little Marcus to want to go into engineering? And then what was the transition from engineering into, I mean, a pretty solid resume of experiences on the marketing side that we're going to get into, like tie those things together for us. Yeah. I think the, the irony of it, or maybe coincidence of it all is that I got into engineering because of the cultural forces telling me that that's what was normal for people like me. If you did well in math and science in the nineties, and especially if you were black, you're going to be an engineer full stop. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's what I went into because those were the societal expectations of me and those social forces that were being pushed against me came from my family, my parents in particular came from the institutions in which I was learning school uh, uh, came from my peer set. They were also experiencing the same social pressures. So though in my heart of hearts, I wanted to be a musician. You know, I wanted to be the fifth member of boys to men, in my heart of hearts uh, engineering was the logical thing. So that's what I did. Right. It's like, you know, you're going to a, an amazing institution of higher learning, the University of Michigan. Um, then it's time to get serious, to take advantage of your advantage. So when I came to school here, I was like, I'm going to do engineering. And I studied materials engineering because I used to spend every summer um, at a college, a summer engineering academy. And I remember there was a career fair where there were many different engineers, their professionals that were showcasing their form of engineering. And there were the, the electrical engineers over here. There were the, uh, the, the industrial operations folks over there. There was the civil engineers over there who were building, constructing things. And then I saw uh, this guy who had a piece of a spaceship, a space shuttle. And on one side of it, he had a blowtorch and he fired up the blowtorch and it got like red hot, literally. Like you saw it, it was red. And then he said, touch the other side. I was like, no way I'm doing that. He's like, touch the other side. I'm like, fam, not happening. And then he touched it and he's like, touch it. So, you know, with, with much hesitation, I touched it and it was cool. And I was like, that's amazing. Cause it's only like that much material, right? It's, it's you know, maybe an inch and a half of material. It's not a whole lot there. And he's like, that's what I do for a living. And I go, I want to do that. That's dope. <laughs> so I was like materials engineering. That's what I'll do. Right. Polymer. That's what I'm going to focus on polymers. So I came to Michigan to study that. Um, and I realized pretty early on in my college tenure, because that's what it felt like, uh, <laughs> that I wasn't meant to be an engineer, at least not in the prototypical form of what an right. engineer was. My, my yeah. early classes, man, I was just, school was kicking <laughs> my butt. And I was like, man, maybe I'm, this isn't for me. Marcus, I find that super interesting because if I reflect on my own path, it's very similar, good at math and science, family pressure, started in engineering. When I went to college, I got into civil engineering and then realized 
after the third semester, it wasn't for me. So I switched into communications and journalism. Uh, I'm curious when you made your switch. So you, you graduate from Michigan, you went, you then let, went back to Michigan, correct? And got your yeah. master's degree, but it was an MBA. So yeah, what was the kind of the light bulb moment of, okay, I think I know what I want to do now that I know I don't want to do that, but this is what I want to do. It was pretty shortly after my first semester on campus. I was like, I don't think I want to be an engineer. I, I mean, I remember this vividly that my GPA was, I think I got like a 2.85. And I worked really hard for that 2.85. Like I bust my butt for a 2.85 and I never saw a great grades that low ever in my life. Like I remember in my parents' house, there's a plaque in my parents' house uh, where I was, where I was, recognized as being um, of the top 5% of students coming out of the city of Detroit. And you fast forward a semester later, I'm going to 2.85. Like this is not the math ain't mathing. Um, and I remember after my freshman year, that summer, I said, you know, mom and dad, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think I want to do engineering. And my mother goes, wait till you get into your major. You'll love it. My mother's an academic. So, you know, she knows I trust her. Uh, so I went back to school. Uh, my, my sophomore year and I was like, oh, this definitely ain't for me. I mean, my major, I'm like, this ain't, this ain't for me. And I ended up taking some music theory courses just to offset my terrible GPA. And I fell in love with major seven. So I go, this is the thing. This is the thing. This is the thing. It felt familiar, but new at the same time. It's my first time feeling uh, as a college student excited about learning. Like I was excited about going to class. I was reading proactively. I was very very, very invested. Um, and after my sophomore year, I came home and said, mom and dad, I know what I want to do for a living. They go out with it. So I want to be a songwriter. They go, Oh no, you don't. <laughs> that is not true. You do not want to be a songwriter. And I go, oh, yeah, I do. And they go, well, first of all, you don't. And secondly, you ain't. So I finished my engineering degree at Michigan, but I spent all of my, my access time and time. I was supposed to be in class, honestly. Um, in the recording studio. I took all my electives in the School of Music, learning how to write and produce music. So when I graduated, um, I graduated right after 9-11, the market was terrible. And there were students, my classmates, who were killing it in school and their jobs either got pushed back or rescinded altogether. And I go, if these guys can't get a job, I'm definitely not getting a job. So I might as well pursue the thing I really wanted to do, which was music. So I went to the music business. I worked at Universal Music Group as an intern. That didn't feel like the right part of the business to be on because I wanted to create things, not to be on the business side. So I moved, uh, I, was, I lived in Ann Arbor and I ran a recording studio for one of my professors in the School of Music. And I just essentially just recorded my own stuff. When the paid sessions were over, I was writing and producing my own stuff. And I ended up partnering with another Michigan engineer who didn't want to do engineering. And we started a company together. He did all the business side. I did all uh, the creation side. And we were writing and producing music. Had a couple uh, uh, remixes placed. Uh, but we really kind of hit our stride. We we're doing partner marketing. We, I know that's what it was. But we were helping brands who wanted to like dip their toe in music but not spend a lot of money. We were kind of brokering those deals for them. And then once the music industry like really hit the, 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 the iceberg, if you will, I, our little business went out of business or started to, to unwind very quickly. So we figured one of us should probably figure out this whole thing called business because neither of us were business people. <laughs> so I went to business school and he went to go uh, work for this junior senator from Illinois uh, named Barack Obama, who had the ambition Heard of him. and audacity to run for president of the United States. That's incredible. <laughs> Man, these are like, honestly, first of all, that wasn't in the book. Like none of that part's in the book. And so we're learning new things. Uh, yeah. Marcus's book, For the Culture, by the way, has been something that uh, has sent shockwaves in all the good way uh, through RKD and via RKD into other aspects of the nonprofit marketing and fundraising circle. So you... You then take this um, this career in music that you're pursuing in uh, a 
economic environment and just a social environment that is trying to realign itself post 9-11. And, and then you find your way into advertising. Yeah. So I, I, go, into the, I go to business school to study strategic brand management because to me that felt like the most creative part of business. And I wanted to <laughs> understand this disruption that was happening in the music industry. And I wanted to stay in music, no doubt. And in my mind, I only wanted to work for one company, and that was Apple. Because at the time, Apple, was, they were the music industry. They were the disruptor in the music industry. So I feel like if I was going to understand it, I need to work with people who are actually doing the disruption. So thankfully, I got a gig uh, doing partner marketing at iTunes. And it was you know, great. You know, I'm like learning the ins and outs of all these things that are happening from this behemoth organization that I just loved dearly. I mean, working at Apple was a dream job for me. Um, I did an internship there during my MBA program. And at the end of the summer, typically for an MBA, you'll get an offer to come back at the end of your second year, right? To end of your, your program. But I was at Apple uh, during the, right before the recession of 2008. So my boss goes, man, you crushed it this summer. And typically we'll give you an offer right now. However, we're on a hiring freeze. So I can't give you an offer for the future. And I go, that is a bummer. Like, that's the worst. And he goes, but, but since technically you are an employee, I can hire you now. And I go, I guess I still have a whole, you know, year of, of school to finish. And he goes, just work remotely. And I go, done. Count me in. So my last year of the MBA program, I was working full time at Apple, which was pretty awesome. Uh, so by the time I graduated, I didn't do any recruitment because I had a job. And I called my, my, my boss you know, shortly before graduation said, hey, I'm done in May. I want to do a little traveling you know, before uh, I get out to Cupertino. So what time do you want me, when do you want me on, on, on campus? And he goes, I'm glad you called because uh, we did some little shifting, some rejiggering. Um, and unfortunately, you know, you're going to be moved over to Mobile Me. And if you don't know what Mobile Me is, it doesn't exist anymore. It is now iCloud, but MobileMe was not a good look for, for, for Apple. And he's like, that's all we have in the organization. So it's either that or nothing. And I go, I guess it's nothing for you, boy. In the middle of a recession. And my parents go, we have raised an idiot. This, they, we raised the dumbest kid there is. Because I think it's timing. You, like, you, you, right now, what we know in, in the path of Marcus is timing is, I don't know, questionable. Yeah, yeah. Anytime I'm in school, don't go to school because it's going to be bad news bears. And so, I, you know, I, I had 116 grand of debt around my neck from the MBA program uh, mm. in the middle of a recession, no leads, no job opportunities. And I just moved to New York, packed two bags, my Nikes on my feet. I moved to New York. I got a, 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 a room that was subletting off Craigslist, which we now know is a super dangerous thing. Didn't know it then. I moved to New York to sort of figure it out, to kind of beat the bushes. And in doing that, I mean, I'm meeting almost everybody you could think of in the music industry, like, you know, really like prominent names, like Lior Cohen, Russell Simmons, Kadar Massenberg, like all these major, major, major people, Kevin Lyles in, in the music industry. And there are always these really close calls, like so close, an offer's coming and then just falls apart. And I go, maybe this... Maybe this isn't for me because this doesn't seem to be working. And to my surprise, I get introduced to this gentleman named Matthew Knowles, who has a daughter named Beyonce Knowles. And as I come to find out, he goes, let me get this straight. You're an engineer. You started a music company. Uh, you have an MBA. You worked at Apple and you're black. Fam, you're a unicorn. You don't exist. You're not real. I go, no, I, I, I am real. He says, you should run digital strategy for Beyonce. And I go, well, yeah, I should totally do that. So I ended up running digital strategy for Beyonce during the I Am Sasha Fierce days, which is like an amazing time to be in the Beyonce business. It's never a bad time to be in the Beyonce business. This is a particularly good time to be in the Beyonce business. And, and, and for me, this is sort of the apex of my career in, in, in music. You know, I'm working with one of the biggest artists on the planet. But what I'm realizing running digital in 2009 at this point, 2009, 2010, what I realize is that the music industry is just so far behind with regards to these new technologies. And the industry is actually using the tech well and breaking new artists better than the record labels were, were advertisers. I mean, think about like 
iTunes ads in those days, or, or they're really, they were iPod ads in those days, like Matt and Kim Feist, they were like breaking artists. And I go, that's, that's where I need to be on the advertising side. They know the technology better than the music industry does. And they're actually making greater contributions to music discovery, to new artists, uh, uh, new artist development than record labels were. So I was like, advertising is where I, I want to be. So that's where I kind of set my sights. So you're working for Beyonce. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, what what was some of the the strategy you were, you were employing? Because this is this is about the time of the rise of social media, right? Like yeah. early days of Facebook. That's right. What what did you what did you put into play? Like, what were some of the things you came up with, and maybe some some lessons learned that oh, yeah. you could share with us? So, by and large, a major part of my gig uh, was about kind of setting an ecosystem for Beyonce that whatever door you went into, you bumped into other things. So if you came in because you love the music, you bump into her, her, uh, her, her, her acting, right. Obsession, Cadillac records, dream girls. If you came in through the movie, the movie door, which is probably odd, but let's just say you do, um, you stumble into her relationships with like L'Oreal and, and Vizio and Walmart and Nintendo. And the idea is that these things became sort of what we call now a flywheel, that they all sort of touch each other and propel each other forward. Um, and a large part of this was how do we engage her fans uh, online? And at this time, to your point, Ronnie, you got Facebook, you got uh, uh, Twitter, Foursquare, if you guys remember Foursquare, like these are all the things that are at our disposal to help engage uh, her her fans. And I go, oh man, this is about to be easy as pie. Like it's Beyonce. Like you just say, you just do the thing. You say, hey, we're doing a thing, and people will show up. But what I realized is that this is not the case. You know, we were trying to engage fans and build a community around fans. But the biggest learning I found was that you don't build community; you facilitate it. And you facilitate it by finding the people who already believe what you believe. You know, uh, uh, you know we, we were trying to build this thing we later we'll call the, the Beyontourage, right? Her fan club. Uh, but what the team will later find out is that there were a group of people off in the recesses of the internet who had a set of beliefs, had a set of ideologies that were already congruent with that of Beyonce. And the team ultimately, this is after I'd left, decided to say, let's cut bait on this Beyontourage nonsense and let's engage those folks. In fact, let's make those folks the official fan club of Beyonce, which became the, the, the Beehive, right? And, and the learning for me from afar at that is that, dude, you don't create communities. You facilitate and foster them. You find the people who already believe and you use your resources to bring them together. And you know we see this play out today with the Beehive you see this play out today with Taylor Swift and the Swifties, right? It, it's it's a game plan or it's a strategy uh, that I wish, you know, in hindsight, I I I, I had enough wherewithal to to, to leverage. Um, but now I know, and that's sort of the gospel that I preach today. The uh, I feel like the experience that you just outlined with working on Beyonce you almost had the reciprocal experience in helping launch the Brooklyn Nets. Oh yes. Like as a, oh, yeah. as a brand, because that was all about engaging uh, a literal community, <laughs> like, you're, like a yeah. geographic space around a set of values. And so kind of parallel those two projects and those two um, chapters of your life for us. So the Brooklyn Nets, to your point, you know, this is fans. They're literal. They're fans. They're fans who are fans of the team. And what the Brooklyn Nets, the fans of the New Jersey Nets, rather, what Brooklyn Nets wanted, they wanted the Brooklyn Nets to be to Brooklyn what what the Knicks were to New York, New York City, Manhattan in particular. And you go, whew, that is a really tall feat. Because you have an export from New Jersey to, to New York, which is not very welcome, right? Like outside of like Billy Joel and Bon Jovi and, 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 and uh, Bruce Springsteen's, like New York doesn't love a lot of New Jersey export, right? Just be, keep it true. Um, not only that, launching the team meant the building of an arena, the Barclays Center, 
that was going to upseat a lot of local residents and a lot, a lot of uh, local businesses, which wasn't welcome. Right? In fact, there were protests. There were documentaries about the protests. Um, and on top of that, the team wasn't good. Like no shade, but the team was not good. They, they were miserable. They were yes. really bad. That's right. No championships. It's n- n- nothing. Right. Nothing. Yeah. Not a good value proposition if you're trying to sell a thing. So you know, I thought about like my experiences. It's like, okay, let's not think about fans. Forget fans for a moment. Like, who should we focus on? Let's focus on community, people. Well, so the people we want to move are Brooklynites. Well, what do we know about Brooklynites? Well, Brooklynites are a proud bunch. Very, very proud, right? So maybe we can ignite the stoke the pride that exists in Brooklynites in such a way, in a manner that Brooklynites will adopt this team as a receipt of their identity of being Brooklynites, right? So it's not about the team. It's not about the value proposition. It's not about the gameplay. It's about what this brand represents, what it means, which is what brands are, the vessels of meaning. So, okay, great. So how do we do that? Well, we're able to borrow some from some some theory. And thankfully, you know, there are people who are a million times smarter than me that provide really good inspiration. One of those, those persons is a gentleman by the name of Edward Bernays, the godfather of propaganda and the second nephew of Sigmund Freud, actually. Uh, and he has one of these, the, these provocations. He says that you can unite a people by declaring an enemy of the state. And thankfully for us with Brooklyn, there is an inherent enemy of the state, Manhattan. So the entire strategy was like, let's stoke the rivalry. By stoking the rivalry, we'll be stoking the pride of Brooklyn and Brooklyn will adopt the Brooklyn Nets as a way to say that they are Brooklynites. And just learning from my, my folly, learning from experiences that you use your resources to facilitate community as opposed to trying to create something anew. So through these experiences with Beyonce, with the Brooklyn Nets, is this about when you, I'm trying to understand like, when did the idea about culture and community and that identity that you bring with it, is it starting to form around this time? Is it kind of somewhere in the back and you haven't quite brought it forward yet? I would say it's, it was a bit of a word stew at, the, at that time. You know, I started reading the social sciences. I was working in an agency um, called Translation who would tout this point of view that, and that they were existed to help ambitious brands thrive in contemporary culture. And I would say it all the time. We help ambitious brands thrive in contemporary culture. But if you ask me to define culture at the moment, at that time, I didn't have a good answer for you. I gibberish. Like, it was like, you know, is essentially sort of a shortcut for popularity. What's popular? What's hip? What's hot? What's cool? And that was sort of the way in which, you know, at least me as representative for the agency would present itself that like, we, we got to, we have a, we have a, the, the pulse of culture. We have, a, you know, our finger on the pulse. So we know what's happening. So we can then help you be cool brand who knows nothing about coolness. And that was sort of how I thought about culture, but the more, I started to study the behavioral sciences. The more I started to, to study the, 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 the physics of human behavior, the underlying physics of humanity, my frames on what culture was began to shift. And I started to kind of question a lot of things I was saying and start to ask myself, what do you mean when you say that? Because you said this, but that's not what that actually means. And, and this, this interrogation is what started to get me closer and closer and closer to the scholarship. And the closer I got to the scholarship, the more, uh, the, the, the more uh, excited I got about the practice. And the more I studied the behavioral science, the better the practice became. The more I practiced, the more curious I became about uh, behavioral science. That gummit, you created your own flywheel. Like yeah. you didn't even well, know that you were doing yeah. it, right? Yeah. Okay, so so I've got I guess two things that are going through my mind as you're talking through this, Marcus. One is um, there is so much of your story that I love the combination of how intentional you are at pursuing something that you're passionate about and how you're making your own luck and finding yourself into spaces that you step into, and it's like 
it's this really interesting push and pull. I'm curious who, as you reflect on it now, who are the people that were mentoring and guiding you or that part? Mm. And then second, um, having spent time with members of RKD and the, you know, the nonprofit leaders that, um, we spent time around together back in the fall, et cetera. How, how do you think about this practice, this practice of culture as it relates to yeah. philanthropy and, mm-hmm. uh, and individuals connection to causes? Yeah. So interestingly, and maybe this is a, a, um, a, a sobering moment is that like, I didn't have a lot of direct mentors, right? Um, there were people who saw something in me that gave me opportunities. I wouldn't say they necessarily mentored me, but they gave me opportunities. I think about like my first job at Apple. I shouldn't have gotten that job. There was nothing on my resume that said I was ready for that gig, right? But uh, my manager, Ed Swajnajar, uh, the head of the group I was in, partner marketing, a guy named Matt Fisher, they saw something in me that other people didn't see, and they gave me a shot, right? Working for Beyonce, I had no business having that job. No business at all, right? But Matthew Knowles saw something in me that other people didn't see, and he gave me a chance to swing. The, at translation, good night. Like I, there's, I had no business in those rooms, but Steve Stout saw something in me that somebody else didn't see and gave me a, a swing, right? And it was these kind of series of people seeing my potential and giving me the chance uh, that, that, that really opened up the doors for me. And there are people along the way who poured in important to me. I think like John Bond at, 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 when I was at Big Fuel, the first agency I worked at, you know, he saw something in me and would kind of give me like pointers. Um, and on the academic side, the gentleman named uh, Professor John Branch here, who was my professor in the business school that really became, you know, my, my conduit into, into academia, you know, like he, he treat he treated me like a peer, even though he really, it was definitely like a, a, uh, an Obi-Wan Luke relationship for sure. But a- along the way, there wasn't a lot of people who were like, oh, I'm going to like really make sure this guy is good, right? They gave me opportunities. And I feel like my biggest mentors were 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 the scholars. Like Dan Ariely, who I know now, like we're not close friends, but like Dan Ariely changed my life, literally changed my life. One of the biggest inflection points in my life was Dan Ariely's predictably irrational, right? And my grandfather used to always say this. He was a minister. He used to always say this, that like reading is like brain surfing. You get to surf the brains of people you don't know just by investing yourself in their reading. And that's what I did. Like, you know, my heart was broken yesterday when Daniel Kahneman passed because I've read Kahneman's work like mad. I studied his work like mad. You know, uh, people like like, uh, um, Grant McCracken, People like Rob Kosnett, people like Doug Holt, like these people, I've, I've, I've befriended them now, but they were sort of a guiding light for me. And, and I would look at sort of the work that they did to get a sense of what I ought to do. Like those were my mentors in, in the world of practice. And you know, spending time with the leaders in, in philanthropy when we were back in D.C., what I thought was interesting to me is that they're all motivated by something beyond the value propositions. They believe in something. Like they, they, they do the work they do, not because it's a huge moneymaker for them. They do it because they believe. And everything we know about culture, everything that, we, that, that, that the scholars have been telling us about culture is that culture is anchored in identity and belief, full stop. Who we are and what we believe. I think, um, I think it was Nathan who's one of the speakers, you know, he says that like, if Nathan Chappelle, yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. He said that if, if nonprofits would think like nonprofits would start thinking like nonprofits and not like commercial entities, it would be rocket fuel in what they do. And what he meant by that, at least the way I interpret it is that I try to teach for-profit entities to think like nonprofits. What do you believe? How do you see the world? Not what you sell, but what do you believe? What's your ideology? 
Like, well, what's your worldview? What's your conviction? What's the thing that you're willing to stand for? What's the thing that you're willing to stand for even if you're the only one? What's the thing that you're willing to reduce market share, to like empty the bank because you believe this thing? That's what you go preach. That's what you spend your time focused on, not what you sell. And the inverse, however, is that nonprofits are like, what can I learn from Nike? <laughs> what can I learn from this for-profit brand? I'm like, they're learning from you. Like, look in the mirror. And that, that is at the crux of the work that I do. I study culture and its influence on behavior from consumption to organizations to society. And what we know about culture is that culture is anchored in identity and beliefs. And I'm sitting here with some of the, 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 the most powerful uh, nonprofits in the world, like some of the 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 household you know the 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 household name brands that we know powerful brands that have great cognitive real estate in people's minds great distinctiveness and they don't know who they are and I just looked at them the whole time I was there I was like y'all look in the mirror look who you are like say it with your chest right and and if we start with what we believe and the belief you have is so rich so so unbelievably powerful if you start with the soul, then end with the cell, the, 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 what you do as an entity will, will increase in magnitude what comes back to you. Do you just want to keep going, man? Like, do you just like, can you just keep, you're just this, you're this shy of ranting and we're like, yes, yes, yes. Keep, keep it going. Yes. I mean, it, it, dude, this is. Um, it's one of those, uh, louder for those in the back kind of moments. And, and, and you know, and the thing is that like, we know it. And, and this is, this is the, this is the, this is why, again, why I feel obligated to be an instructor. Cause we know these things intuitively, but the minute that we go into like business mode, we take off our human hat and put on our, I'm a business person hat. So let's think about fiduciary responsibilities. Let's think about, you know, increasing, you know, shareholder value. And that's what for-profits company do. But what's the shareholder value for a nonprofit? Like what's the fiduciary responsibility for an, a nonprofit? It's to serve the belief. And the belief is in service of people. And I say to yourself that like, then focus on that. Focus on that. Go preach that. And the people who believe, those people will move. Now, the question becomes, and I actually had an MBA student ask me this yesterday. It was great. And I don't know why I never articulated like this before, but I was on one. I, mean, I, was, I, was like, I was like really going. Like I was like feeling myself. I was feeling myself. I was so like into what we were talking about. And you know, I was like, you, know, you got to have a belief. You got to have an ideology. Like that's what you stand on and that's what you preach. And he raised his hand sort of, you know, it wasn't even sheepish. He was like, oh, I got a question for you. And he goes, you know, but if you lead with what you believe, aren't you going to repel people? Aren't people going to say, well, I don't believe that, so no thank you. And I go, of course. And yeah. looked at me sort of incredulously like, well, what do you mean? And why are you telling me to repel people if I have a fiduciary responsibility to, to drive shareholder value up? And I asked him, I said, well, let's talk marketing for a moment. Can you target everyone? And he goes, no, it's ridiculous. Like, you can't, you can't convert everybody, right? And he goes, yeah, exactly. And I'm like, why? Because like, you don't have resources to it, and your product isn't in for everybody. And he runs down a list like a very, you know, a very learned MBA ought to. And I go, great. So if you know that truth, if you know that truth, then why are you afraid of repelling people if you know that you're inherently going to repel people? And he goes, you're right. And I was like, I know I'm right. <laughs> That's the idea here is that you know your belief, you, you know that your product, whatever your product is, isn't for everybody. So let's focus on the people for whom it is for. Yeah. And those people are the people who see the world the way we do. So go yeah. preach the gospel to them. But there's this inherent fear, this loss aversion. Again, back to recalling uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman, this loss aversion that like, oh, I don't want to, oh, I want to leave this a little bit open for for like just for those people maybe maybe for those people just leave a little bit open i want to make it too tight make it just a little bit a little bit looser like maybe i can appeal to more people 
And you go, well, you shoot yourself in the foot, friend. Yeah. Start with the people who are most likely to move, the, the collective of the willing. And those are the people who see the world the way you do. And, and, you know, this is where this aligns so much with uh, the way that we think uh, as an entity in service of the nonprofits that we work with, because, you know, it, it's an understanding who you are uh, as an organization and an understanding the people who believe in you. Yeah. You can't understand that through the lens of purely a transaction like that is that is in no way, shape or form the best way to understand a person and to better align yourself with a person. It's one of the reasons why, you know, this year, one of our four big things is the idea of being you like lean into who you are because you're the best at being you as yeah. an organization. So lean into that and you'll find a new level of authenticity that connects with people and to your point repels others. And that's okay. And that's the scary part though. That's the scary part. Yeah. That is the scary part. And I get it. I mean, I empathize. I get it, right? I felt like it took me 40 years to be brave enough to be myself. You know, it, 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 it's, it's a scary thing, you know? Yeah. Um, but I guess like it, it dawned on me that like I'd rather be rejected for who I am than rejected for someone I was trying to be. You know, you imagine, you know, you're on a first date and like, you're trying to be this kind of funny. You're trying to be this kind of thing. And the person goes like, ah, I just didn't feel it. Like I'm looking for someone that's more like that. And I'm like, I'm actually that. Wait a minute. I'm actually that thing you wanted. Can we rewind? I, I, that's me. <laughs> like, can we do this again? Let me try it again. I can actually be myself, you yeah. know? And it's yeah. like, we, 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 again, back to the behavioral sciences. Like, like we, we, we try to mimic what we think people want of us so that we can be liked. And it, and and we it, it's deep in our humanity to want to be like we want to want to belong that is we're social animals by nature right uh, but we can't belong to everybody we're yeah. meant to yeah. be in, in in tribes we're meant to be in, in small tight knit networks so the idea is find your tribe find your network the people who see the world the way you do preach the gospel to them and they'll go yes and here's the beautiful part it stimulates a network effect where they go find other people on your behalf. Not because of what you are, but because of who they are. And good Lord, yes. that's more powerful than anything uh, you could spend your money trying to do. Absolutely. Uh, for our listeners, as we wrap up, here's the thing. Uh, if you're not following Marcus Collins on LinkedIn, that is step one, because uh, you hear him getting fired up here and you can see it. Uh, and And it's something to behold. And, uh, man, we just, uh, we appreciate you so much and appreciate, uh, the things that you preach and, uh, and for the culture is, like I said, it's available on Amazon folks can and should go out and get it. It's required reading for anyone that listens to this, uh, episode, there will be a quiz at some point. And right. it is something that has transformed the way that we think inside our company and the way that we think about the work that we do. And so we can't thank you enough for um, your passion and your point of view. And man, we just, we want you to continue to do it. Oh man, I'm super grateful. And I feel, I feel like we, we are, we're in the same network here. We're after the same things. Um, and so anytime I get a chance to contribute to the great work that you all do, uh, I consider it an honor and a privilege. <laughs> You're a good one, Dr. Marcus Collins. You're a good one. We, uh, man, we can't wait to uh, to catch up again down the road. Indeed.